and I welcome you to Mount Harmony Baptist Church. This morning I want you to turn with me in the Gospel of Luke, and I want you to turn to chapter 24, and we're going to look at verses 13 through 15. I know that the text in your bulletin list a lot longer than that, more verses than that, but uh, we're going to talk about those verses, but we're going to basically begin by reading those three verses, chapter 24, verse 13, verse 14, and verse 15. That's page 897, page 898, if you use one of the Holman Pew Bibles in front of you. Right now, let's stand together as we honor the reading of God's Word, Luke chapter 24, beginning in the 13th verse. And here's what the Bible says. Now that same day, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Together they were discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, notice that word, discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk with them. Now may the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Thank you. I read the story this past week about a five-year-old who had a part in the children's Christmas pageant at church, or rather the Easter pageant at church, and he was kind of nervous about doing that part. His one line was this, he is not here, he is what? Risen. He's not here, he's risen. When it came the night of the performance, he basically just went blank. He drew a total blank, couldn't think of a single word, and finally the first thing that came to mind, he blurted out, and this little boy said in that Easter pageant, he's not here, he's in prison. <laughs> well, thank God he's not in prison, amen? And he's no longer in prison by the tomb. He's no longer held captive by death. He is alive, and that's why we're here today. That's why we're here every Sunday, as a matter of fact. We're not here for a funeral for Jesus. We're here for a resurrection celebration, amen? And we need to notify our face, hey, this is a great occasion. It's not a funeral service. It's not a memorial service. It's a resurrection service. And every Sunday is an Easter celebration in God's house. In fact, that's why we worship on Sunday, to commemorate and to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Sunday 2,000 years ago. So if you're one of those folks and you'd like to come to church on Easter only, I've got news for you. You need to be here every Sunday because that's why we meet on the Lord's Day to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, according to Luke 24, it was that first Easter Sunday 2,000 years ago, and the Bible tells us that two of Christ's followers were on the road to Emmaus. Literally, they were on the road from Easter because Easter had already happened by this time. Last week we talked about the road to Easter. Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. Luke chapter 9 verse 51. And now we're on the road from Easter. And these two disciples are on the road to Emmaus. And their walk teaches us so much about Jesus Christ. What it means to know him. Not just one day a week on Easter but every single day of the week. And so I want us to join these two on the road to Emmaus, and I want us to walk with them for a few moments and learn what they learned on that first Resurrection Sunday 2,000 years ago. I want to share with you a couple of things. First of all, on the road from Easter, they experienced revelation. They experienced revelation. Now Emmaus was a small fishing village. It was about seven miles northwest of Jerusalem and it would take about two hours for the average man to walk this distance and to make that journey. Now only one of these two travelers on the road to Emmaus, the road from Easter, is identified. His name is Cleopas and many people speculate about the other person's identity. The Bible never tells us. Some people think it was perhaps the spouse of Cleopas and we know from John chapter 19 that would be Mary, a woman by the name of Mary. Not the Virgin Mary and not Mary Magdalene, but another Mary. And there were several ladies by that name who were followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Other people say, no, this traveler unidentified was actually Luke. And Luke, out of modesty, just doesn't mention his name in his own gospel. We don't know for sure. What we do know for sure is that they walked along the road to Emmaus, the road from Easter, and the Bible tells us they were discussing the strange events, the unusual occurrences of the last 72 hours. They had seen Jesus Christ, their hope of the Messiah, die on the cross. They knew that he'd been buried in a borrowed tomb. And now came the reports back from the cemetery, good news that Jesus was not there, but he had risen from the dead. 
Seldom do we get good news from a cemetery. But on the first Easter, there was good news, incredibly great news that came from a cemetery, and that is that the grave was empty because Jesus had risen again. And that's what these men were talking about that morning. They had heard these reports. They didn't know really what to make of it at this particular point, and somehow they were trying to wrap their mind around the reports they had heard. Now, apparently, this discussion got a little bit heated. In verse Verse 15, it says they argued among themselves. And then in verse 17, the word disputed is also used. Now, some of the heaviest and most difficult arguments, sometimes the most heated arguments between people, involve religion. And you know that, and I know that. And that's why some people have said, well, there are two things we shouldn't talk about. We should not talk about what? Politics and religion. We shouldn't talk about those two things. And here's the reason why. They were having a heated discussion about these two subjects, about the politics of Rome, the execution of Jesus, and also the resurrection. They were talking about religion. Now, these men, remember, were frustrated. They were disappointed. They were hurt. They were disillusioned. They were depressed at this particular point. Their hearts were filled with doubt. They knew Jesus had died. But was he really alive again? And if he was the Messiah, why in the world would he die? They just couldn't put it together in their mind. They just didn't know what to believe at that time. Now, as they walked along that road to Emmaus, the road from Easter, the Bible says suddenly a stranger showed up and joined himself with the two travelers. Now, we don't, or they didn't understand who that mysterious traveler was that joined them but we know the identity because the Bible tells us that this was none other than Jesus Christ himself they didn't recognize him now Luke says this they were prevented from recognizing him at first God didn't reveal his identity to them now some people say see there here's Jesus in his resurrected body he's come out of the grave and these disciples didn't know him. Therefore, when we get to heaven and we have our glorified bodies, we're not going to know each other either. Is that right or wrong? Well, I believe it's wrong. I believe the Bible teaches us that we will know even as also we are known. And I believe in heaven I'm going to recognize you and you're going to recognize me. We're going to know each other personally in heaven better than we ever knew each other upon the earth. And that is good news. In fact, I think we ought to start practicing down here right now, just loving on each other and worshiping the Lord together. This is a preview, this is a prelude to what we're going to do in heaven. Now, Chuck Swindoll tells this little story. He says, to dwell above with saints we love, that will be glory. But to live here below with people we know, <laughs> that's quite a different story. I want to tell you something. We ought to start loving each other and worshiping together more and more because guess what we're going to do in heaven? Exactly that. Now, why didn't these men recognize Jesus? If we're going to know each other in our glorified bodies, why didn't these men recognize Jesus? Well, first of all, you've got to remember, they're traveling along the road to Emmaus. They've been through a very difficult weekend. They're suffering inside emotionally. They're drained. They've been through sleepless nights, no doubt. They're depressed. They're despondent. And somehow they just don't focus and recognize Jesus. Specifically, the Bible says that God withheld the identity of Jesus because he wanted to meet them where they were and take them to where he wanted them to be. Now, normally, that's the way God works with us. It's called progressive revelation. He doesn't reveal everything about Jesus to us right off the bat. And very rarely, the first time a person hears the gospel, do they respond and say, yes, sometimes it happens, it could happen, but normally it doesn't. It takes a number of times hearing the gospel and then responding and saying yes to Jesus Christ. And God moves us from where we are to where he wants us to be. It's like a child. When a child goes to kindergarten, we don't automatically start teaching them calculus and algebra and geometry. Basically, we teach them one, two, three three, four. And then we move up a little bit further and we say two plus two equals four and three plus three equals six and four plus four equals eight. And we gradually move them along progressively. And that's the way God normally works with us. And Jesus met these men where they were and patiently and lovingly he moves them through the process of full recognition of who he was and what he had done for them. That's the very way 
He works with each one of us. Now I want to guarantee you today that we serve a God who wants to reveal himself to us. He wants us to know him. He hasn't hidden in a corner of heaven somewhere and withdrawn himself away from us. He's not a hermit God. Instead, he is a God who wants us to know him and to serve him and to represent him and to worship him for all of eternity. That's the plan of the Father. And he wants to reveal himself to us. That's why he revealed himself to Adam and Eve after they had eaten the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden and they had sinned. That's why he revealed himself to Abraham while Abraham lived in a pagan country called Ur of the Chaldees. That's why he revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush and Moses had committed murder and now he's hiding out on the backside of the Midian desert. He's out there all alone supposedly but God came to him and God revealed himself to him. And I want you to understand that our God is a God of revelation. He wants to reveal himself to each one of us. And I believe today there are people in this place that God wants to reveal himself to. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you're from, our God is a God of revelation. And on that road to Emmaus, those two disciples were walking along and Jesus began to reveal God to these two travelers, Cleopas and his friend, whoever it was, and they were on the road from Easter. Now here's the second thing. On the road from Easter, they also experienced not only revelation, but also recognition. Now the Bible says they walked along this road making that seven-mile journey about two hours or so. That was the road from Easter, and Jesus began to talk with them about the Word of God. In fact, Luke says that he started with Moses and the prophets. That's Old Testament. That's all they had at the time. And he began in the Old Testament, their scripture, their word of God, and he began to talk to them about the Savior so that they can recognize what God's plan was for the Messiah and for the Savior of the world. And he was talking about himself. He was revealing himself that they might recognize him in the pages of Scripture. In John 5, 39, Jesus said this would happen. He said, you search the Scriptures because you think you have eternal life in them, and they testify of me. That's what Jesus said. Now, if Jesus wasn't telling the truth, if he really wasn't the Son of God, the Messiah of Israel, the Savior of the world, the King of glory, then that is a bold lie. To take the scripture and say, you know, the scripture we study, the scripture we preach, the scripture we teach, the scripture we believe in, that scripture testifies of me. That would be ultimate blasphemy. But Jesus said the word of God in the Old Testament teaches about me. And that's what he's talking to these two travelers about on the road from Easter. Now talk about a Bible conference. I love to go to Bible conferences where there's one speaker after another and they're sharing the Word of God and hundreds and thousands of people are there. Our voices are united in song and then we listen to the Word of God. Amens punctuate the air. Hallelujahs and praise the Lord. There's nothing like the excitement of studying God's Word. But can you imagine if Jesus is the speaker? And Jesus is taking the Word of God that's all about Him and He's unrolling it and unveiling it and He's helping you to recognize Him on every page of Holy Scripture. That would have been a life-changing experience. And it was through those Scriptures from the Old Testament that Jesus Christ helped these men to recognize what the Messiah would be and what he would accomplish. Now, Warren Wiersbe says this. He said, quote, The key to understanding the Bible is to see Jesus Christ on every page. A lot of people say, well, the New Testament talks about Jesus, and I really don't want much to do with the Old Testament because I want to learn more about Jesus. I want to tell you something. You're cheating yourself. If you don't go back to the Old Testament and see all the types and all the symbols and all the representations of Jesus Christ, I believe Jesus' footprint is on every page of Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament. He's the central focus. He's the central theme. And if you read the Word of God and see anything else but Jesus, you've missed the point. It's all about Jesus. And even if you have only the Old Testament, you can find Jesus there. Isaiah 53, for example, the suffering servant. That's Jesus Christ. He was the one who came. He was the one who suffered all through the Bible. It's all about Jesus. 
And you say, well, you know, I'd like to have a divine teacher like that. Boy, I just wish that Jesus could come down physically and, and just teach me and have a Bible conference like that and we could all sit around his feet and we could listen, we could bask in every word that Jesus spoke. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Hey, I've got some good news for you today. You do have a divine teacher. And that teacher is the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus said, if I go away, I'm going to send another, just like me, comforter, and he's going to come, the Holy Spirit, and he's going to guide you into all truth. Now, I want you to understand something. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, they're all co-equal. They're co-eternal, and they're co-existent. And I can promise you on the authority of God's Word that whatever the Holy Spirit teaches us from Scripture, that's exactly what Jesus Christ would teach us if He were here physically. There's perfect harmony and unity. There's perfect alignment in the Holy Triune Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There's never a disagreement. And so whatever the Holy Spirit teaches us from the Word of God and helps us to recognize Jesus in the Word of God, that's exactly what Jesus would teach us if He were here. Now notice what happened next. In verse 28, skim down there in Luke 24 to verse 28. As they approached Emmaus, Jesus gave the impression that he was going to keep on going further. And then look at this. But they urged him, stay here with us. So Jesus is walking along. They reach their destination. And Jesus acts like he's going to keep on walking. But the disciples, those two disciples, those two people said, no, we want you to come in with us. We want you to spend time with us. We invite you in. And you know what Jesus did? He went in to stay with them for a while. Now, did you know this is exactly how we get saved? You see, Jesus comes by spiritually through the Holy Spirit, through the preaching of God's Word and the teaching of God's Word. And we recognize who He is. We realize that He's our Savior and our Lord. But we have to invite Him into our heart and into our life. And if we don't, he'll pass on to the next person and the next person and the next person. But while he's passing in our life and he's impressing us and convicting us of our sin and, and drawing us, we need to personally invite him into our heart. That's what Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20 is all about where Jesus Christ himself says this, Behold, I stand at the door and what? Knock. I knock. Now when somebody knocks at your door, how do you react? Well, first of all, I think Jehovah's Witnesses. They're here to see me again. Amen? And usually I'm right about that. But when somebody knocks on my door, I know they want access. They want to come in. They want to meet with me. They want to share with me. They're visiting my home. And I need to open the door. And it's the same with Jesus Christ. When he begins to knock at the door of your heart, we have to open that door. Only we can do that. Jesus does not practice home invasion. He doesn't try to invade our heart. Instead, we have to open our heart from the inside and say, Come in, Lord Jesus. Forgive me of my sin. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. We have to open the door. And these disciples opened the door and they said, No, Jesus, don't, don't pass by. Come on in. We invite you into our home, into our hearts, into our life. We want you to spend time with us. We want you inside. And they opened the door for him. The only difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is this. The Christian has opened the door of their heart to Jesus. The other people that don't know Christ haven't done that yet. But when they do, and the Holy Spirit's knocking at the door of their heart, and they say yes, and they invite him in through prayer they also will be saved. And they'll join our ranks, those of us who belong to Christ and know Him as Savior and Lord. But we have to invite Him in. We have to welcome Him. And these two disciples did that on the road from Easter. Now I want you to notice verse 29. Just move down to verse 29 in chapter 24 of Luke's Gospel. Look at this. And so Jesus went in to stay with them. Boy, I like that. Jesus went in to stay with them. Now, I believe when Jesus comes in, he comes in to stay. When Jesus enters your heart and my heart, he comes there not temporarily but eternally. 
He comes to stay, and his promise is, I'll never leave you, and I'll never forsake you, no matter what. He'll be with us no matter what we go through, no matter where we go in life, no matter what. He will be right there. He comes in to stay. And so on this road to Emmaus, this road from Easter, we learn we have to invite Jesus in, but when he comes in, he comes in to stay. One last thing I want to share with you. On the road from Easter, they also experienced revival. They experienced revival. Now, remember when we first met these two travelers, Cleopas and the other, whoever it was? They were walking along, and they were confused. They were depressed. They were disillusioned. They were despondent. They were down. They were defeated. All of that was going on. They didn't know what to think. These strange reports, good news from the cemetery, he's not here. What in the world had happened? They really couldn't piece it together in their mind. But now they've encountered a stranger that we know as Jesus Christ. And the longer they stayed with Jesus, the better they got. The longer they stayed with Jesus, the stronger they became. The longer they stayed with Jesus, the more their faith increased and grew. And we know that these guys were Baptists because when they invited Jesus inside, they had a supper. They had a lunch. They sat down to eat together like all good Baptists do. Now, we joke about that, but eating together is very, very important. It builds our relationship. It builds bonds between us, and it makes a difference because it promotes unity and harmony and fellowship and love. And even in that verse I quoted from Revelation 3.20, where Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and he says, if any man will hear my voice and open the door, that's our responsibility to open the door, I will come in. Not maybe so, think so, hope so, I'll pray about it, get back to you. I will come in and I will what with you? Sup, S-U-P. Now we don't use that word very often. I don't say to my wife at the end of the day, honey, let's go sup. She wouldn't know what the word I was talking about probably. She'd look at me like I was really weird. Let's go sup together, baby. I want to tell you, we don't use that terminology. But sup means supper. It means to eat together. And all the Baptists said, Amen. We love that. We do that well. And it's biblical to do that. And so Jesus wants to come in to sup with us, to fellowship with us, to spend intimate moments with us. Now in the upper room on Thursday night, Jesus shared a meal. The Bible says after the rapture of the church, we're going to the marriage feast of the Lamb. It's going to be a tremendous meal that we're going to shed together. And so the Lord certainly understands the importance of supping, the importance of eating together and feasting together and celebrating together. It's very, very important. Now, here's something that I think is significant. The Bible says that they sat down to this meal and the Bible says they were reclining around the table. Same thing about the Lord's Supper. They didn't really sit on benches or chairs or stools. They reclined on cushions. That's the way it was back in that day. And from a reclining position, they would eat the meal and partake of the meal and so forth. And so these men were reclining with Jesus around the table. And the Bible says that Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it so that they could eat together and share together. Now that sounds a lot like the Lord's Supper, doesn't it? Where Jesus took at the last meal that he had upon this earth with his disciples as far as the death and resurrection was concerned prior to his death and resurrection, that last supper together, and he broke the bread and he gave it to the disciples and they did eat. But this is not the Lord's Supper because at this time only the apostles, only the eleven really understood the Lord's Supper. Judas had already committed suicide by this time. So all the 11 really knew that. These guys would have known that because Cleopas was not an apostle. He was a follower, perhaps, but not an apostle, one of the chosen 11 that remained faithful to the Lord. So this was not the Lord's Supper. This was just a regular, ordinary, day-by-day -day meal. And Jesus took the bread and he broke it. You know what I've discovered? That many times that's when God reveals himself the most to us is in those everyday moments of life just those everyday common occurrences of life that's when Jesus helps us to recognize him and to know him and he touches our heart 
in our life. And let's face it, folks, we have more ordinary days than extraordinary days. Is that true in your life? Just regular, ordinary, nine to five days, you know, mundane, Monday through Friday, Saturday and Sunday. We have more ordinary days than extraordinary mountaintop days. But you know what I've discovered? God wants to be a part of every day in my life. That's why Christianity is not a religion. It's not a form. It's not do's and don'ts. You know what Christianity is? It's a daily relationship with the Son of God. It's a daily walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that these men, when they sat down to meal at this ordinary everyday lunch, they noticed something about Jesus. Suddenly when he blessed that bread and he broke it, they recognized who he was. What was it about praying and breaking that bread? I believe they saw the wounds of Calvary. And they realized this is the very same Jesus that died just a couple of days ago on the cross. This is that same Jesus. He died. He was placed in the tomb. We heard the reports from the women that he was alive, but now we know it ourselves. The women had experienced it earlier that morning at daybreak. But now they experienced it for themselves. Did you know that we can't get to heaven on somebody else's experience? I mean, we can hear testimonies. We can rejoice with people. We can get excited because God's done something wonderful in their lives. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you cannot go to heaven on somebody else's experience with Jesus. You've got to have your own personal experience with him. And these men had heard about the women's experience, but now they experience it for themselves. Jesus Christ face to face, and they see him, and they know exactly who he is, and instantly he disappears. Now why did he disappear? Because his work was done with those men at that particular time. He came to reveal himself, to confirm the resurrection. That's exactly what he did. And it was time for him to move on to other people by spirit, he was still in them. He was there to abide with them. But he moved on to other people to minister to. He had to show himself alive after many infallible proofs. There were other things for him to do. And in his body, he could only be in one place at one time. His mission was complete with those men up to that point. Now their faith was stabilized. Their doubts were erased. Now all of a sudden, that defeated attitude in their heart had turned to victory and triumph. They knew that Jesus was alive. They saw him. They experienced him personally. And then when Jesus disappeared, what was their comment? Didn't our hearts burn within us? Now when we met them, their hearts were cold with doubt, with depression, with defeat, with disillusionment. Their hearts were cold. But now through meeting Jesus Christ, the resurrected Lord, they've been revived and their hearts are burning white hot for the glory of God. Their skepticism has now been turned into faith. Their hopelessness has been erased and now they have renewed hope in the Lord. Their strength that was all but gone has now been restored. Their hearts that were cold are now blazing hot for the glory of God. That is what revival is all about. Is your heart burning within you today because of what Jesus Christ has done in your life? He died for you. He was buried. He rose again. And now if you're a Christian, he lives in your heart and he's brought answers to prayer and victory and triumph in so many ways. Yes, we still have problems, but we know who can solve them. And his name is Yahshua HaMashiach. His name is Jesus. And we know him. We've experienced him. We know that he lives because he lives within our heart. Now these men said, our hearts are burning within us. They were revived. How do we know they really meant what they said? Two things, very quickly in closing. If you look at the closing verses in this story about the road from Easter, the two disciples, the road to Emmaus, you'll see two things they did that I believe that every person who meets Jesus also needs to do. First of all, the Bible says this. The Bible says after this experience, they returned to Jerusalem. And they found the 11 remaining apostles and the other followers of Jesus. And quote, they gathered together. Now why had they gone to Emmaus? I don't know. Bible never tells us. 
Maybe they'd gone to get supplies or maybe they were so discouraged they just wanted to get away from Jerusalem, away from all of it, and just go back to their home village in Emmaus. I don't know. But they went to Emmaus, but now after meeting Jesus, they want to get back to where Christ's followers are. They want to get back with fellow believers. They want to be back where they're gathered together in the name of Jesus, people that love him the way that they loved him. I submit to you that's normal Christianity. When a person gets saved, there's something inside of them. They just want to be with God's wonderful people. They want to be a part of the koinonia. That's the Greek word for fellowship. They just want to be where God's people are gathered. They want to assemble themselves together. And these men had that desire. Once they were revived, they wanted to be faithful and go back and be with God's wonderful people. Second thing they did. The Bible says they told the others what they had experienced with Jesus. They were all talking about the events of the day on that first Easter. They were saying, well, so-and-so saw him, or I saw him, or they saw him, and this was our experience, and this was their experience. And they're comparing notes. And these two men, the disciples of the road to Emmaus, they talk about what they had experienced with Jesus. I want to tell you, one of the marks of a real born-again believer truly revived and on fire for God is that you can't keep quiet about Jesus. You want to tell everybody what he's done for you. You want to share your testimony. You want to ask them, have you had that experience? Because what he did for me, he can also do for you. And there's something that motivates us to want to tell people about Jesus. And these two disciples experienced that on the road from Easter, the road to Emmaus. Let me ask you two questions this morning. Question number one, have you invited Jesus into your life? Many of us have. And we could testify, yes, we did at this age or that age in this place or that place. And yes, there was that time when we opened our heart and received Christ. If you can't honestly say that, I want to give you that opportunity this morning just to open the door of your heart and the door of your life just like those disciples when they got to Emmaus. Come in, Lord Jesus. I want you to have that opportunity. And I'm going to pray a prayer that we call a sinner's prayer and I'm going to ask you to pray it silently after me and just invite Jesus to come into your heart. Maybe he's knocking at your heart's door. Would you open and let him come in? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice, he's calling, he's calling, he's calling, he's calling. He's knocking, he's knocking, he's knocking. If any man will hear my voice, I will come in to him. And that's his promise. Let's bow our heads together. Would you pray after me if you've never prayed this prayer, just silently in your heart. Dear God, I know that I've sinned. And I know that when Jesus came to this earth, he came to seek and to save people like me. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. And today on this Easter Sunday, 2013, I opened the door of my life and the door of my heart. Come in, Lord Jesus. Forgive me of every sin. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. And abide with me forever and forever so that I can abide with you forever and forever. Thank you for saving me in Jesus' name. While every head is bowed and every eye is closed, if you prayed that prayer with me this morning, don't be embarrassed. But would you simply, while no one is looking, lift your hand as a testimony that Jesus has come into your life. Anybody? I prayed that prayer, Pastor Buddy. I'm not going to point you out or embarrass you, I promise. Anybody pray that prayer? God bless you. Anybody? Okay. And then this prayer also. If you're a believer and Jesus is in your heart, is your heart burning within you? On fire for revival and on fire with revival? Maybe it's gotten cold. Maybe it's doubt or fear, circumstances, but something's dampened your revival spirit. Would you pray today, dear Lord, revive us again. Revive me, O Lord, and stir, stir within me those ashes and those embers, O God. And let the flames of white-hot revival spring up in thee and revive this church for your glory and praise. Father, we thank you for hearing and answering these prayers. Lord, we give you all glory and honor. And I pray that you'd bless this altar call in this time of decision publicly that your will might be done. Not mine, not anybody else's, but your will for your glory and yours alone.